welcome to church on this very last Sunday of 2018. It is so great to see you. Welcome to those who are joining us online and at the Outreach Center. Real quick, before we jump into our message, I want to give you a reminder about a series that we will be kicking off next Sunday. Pastor Darrell will be kicking it off. And the title of this series is called The Third Option. And we are going to take three weeks and focus on an issue that is very relevant. And it is the issue of racism. And so often in our culture, we see people angry, revolting, acting out, uh, or either standing silently uh, by and not doing anything. But we believe there's a third option. We believe there is an option that God has called us to as the church. And so for three weeks, we're going to take a look at that. And what I would love for you to do, first of all, is invite someone to come with you. Invite someone to come with you. This is a culturally relevant issue. And you can say to someone you work with, someone in your neighborhood, like, I would love for you to come to church with me and find out where we stand as a church on what we believe God has called us to do around this issue. And then I want you to pray for your pastor as he prepares. Because when you step into enemy territory, when you begin to talk about issues and, and address things where the enemy has had a stronghold for a really long time, um, he has landmines positioned. And he has people positioned who will take a sound bite, who will take something out of context and want to use it against the church. So pray for your pastor, pray for the church, and pray that something supernatural happens. That it's not just another series on racism, but that as God's people, we stand up and say this is sin. And we are going to be the people of God that he's called us to be. So will you do that? I can count on you to do that. Okay. I know you've probably been hibernating for a few days after Christmas. You had lots of sweets. You ate a lot, had lots of family time. And it's time to wake up. It's time to come out of that stupor and get connected, be awake, okay? So I need you to interact with me. I need you to talk to me. Let me know you're there, all right? So are you going to do that for me over the next three weeks? Yeah. All right. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I'm really honored to be able to share with you on this, this last Sunday of 2018. And I want to give you uh, one more resolution to add to your list. Okay, are you ready? Here is the resolution that I want you to add to your list this year. Stop going to church. I knew that was the reaction. Some of you were like, yes, we get to sleep in. We don't have to fight with the kids. This is awesome. She just said, we don't have to go to church. It's what I said, but that's not what I want you to hear. Because I think church gets a bad rap. And I want to challenge your ideas about church, whether you come every week or you just come occasionally. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Now, the reason there is a female pronoun there is because because throughout scripture, the church is referenced as the bride of Christ. And right here we see that Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. You know, we love the idea that, that Jesus died for us personally. And he did. He died for me. He died for you. And we love the idea that he died for my freedom and my peace and my healing. And so often in that self-focused theology, we lose the truth that yes, Jesus died for us, but he died to make us a part of something bigger than ourselves. And we lose sight of that. And if your faith only benefits you, then you have missed why Jesus saved you. If your faith only benefits you, then you have missed why Jesus saved you. And a lot of people want Jesus, but they don't want his church. And, and I thought about that. You know, it's, it would be as if you came up to Daryl and you said, hey, my family and I would love to hang out with you. We'd love to go to dinner, go to a movie. But your wife, eh, she kind of rubs us the wrong way. So could, could you leave her at home? I, I hope he would take that personally and stick up for me. <laughs> but I use that to, to help you understand that what we believe about the church and how we treat the church is a big deal to Jesus. He takes it very personally. And, and I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, maybe you're confused. You know, maybe you think church is man's idea. Religion is man's idea. Church is God's idea. 
And, and to understand the purpose of something, you have to go back to how it started, look at how it began to truly understand the purpose of it. Because sometimes over, over time, we lose sight of the purpose. And so I think maybe with a lot of cultural things that have gone on and, and bad experiences, we could have lost the purpose of the church. So we want to go all the way back to the beginning, 2,000 years ago. Two months after the resurrection of Jesus, a group of people, a little over 100 people, hit the streets of Jerusalem, and they began to share this message. Jesus, who was crucified just outside of this city, rose again three days later. We saw him with our own eyes. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And that simple message turned the city of Jerusalem upside down. Within a few weeks, 5,000 people had embraced the truth about Jesus. So what I need you to see is that the church started as a movement, not as a building, not as an establishment. And this movement had a huge impact on the culture of that day. Our mission statement as a church is to engage our culture with the irresistible love of Jesus Christ. For the purpose of helping people take their first step into a relationship with him. See, we believe an effective church should have an impact on the culture around it. The community and the surrounding areas should know that the church is present. If you're making a difference. So whether you're committed to church or you're a part of the crowd who comes occasionally, I want to give you a few things to think about today. And first I want to talk to the committed person. Because something happened in the early church that often happens in churches and in individuals when we have been a part of this movement for a while. And, and so uh, the church had seen explosive growth. And several months into the life of the early church, there was internal conflict. I know it's surprising to think of conflict in the church. <laughs> there was internal conflict. And it was the argument that Christians have come back to over and over again throughout the centuries. It's the reason many people will say they believe in God, they believe in Jesus for salvation, but you will not find them in a church. And here's what the controversy was. How good do you have to be to get in? How much of your lifestyle do you have to clean up before you can be accepted in the church? So a really cool thing was happening. God was bringing people together from all different backgrounds, a lot like our church. There were people coming to faith who had grown up Jewish, and so they were bringing with them over 600 rules and traditions and, and, and religion. And then you had Gentiles coming to faith who knew nothing about religion, and they were just bringing a lot of bad habits and confusion about God in. And when you mix all of that together, it created a lot of questions and a lot of confusion. And the Apostle Paul was going city to city and he was preaching to the Gentiles. And they were coming to faith and miracles were happening and lives were being changed. And then he found out about some guys who were teaching that in order to come to faith, they had to memorize some things, they had to jump through some hoops, they had to clean up their act before they could come and follow Jesus. Because sometimes there's a tension between the truth of the gospel and the grace of the gospel. And this tension has caused a tug of war, has caused fights within the church for centuries. And when there's conflict, church people get weird. We do. You know, we want to take sides. Which camp are you in? Which side are you on? What do you believe? We build walls and we demonize people who don't agree with us. We think being right is more important than being loving. And Jesus said they will know you by the way you love each other, not by how right you are. And so this continued in the church. And, and you know, it's interesting, this grace and truth thing. People want to land, are you more grace, are you more truth? John, one of the 12 disciples who walked with Jesus and spent time with him, he looked back on the time that he spent with Jesus, and he, he said, you know what? Jesus didn't take a truth side or a grace side. Scripture tells us he was full of both. It wasn't one part grace and one part truth. 
It was a full measure of each. He embodied all grace and all truth. And we see it in his encounter with the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. The religious leaders bring this woman to Jesus. They catch her in the act of adultery, and they bring her to Jesus, and, and they said, okay, Jesus, the Old Testament, the law tells us that we should stone her. What do you say? And Jesus challenged them and said, well, if any of you are without sin, you throw the first stone. And they all began to drop their stones and turn and walk away. And this is the moment where Jesus embodies full grace and full, full truth. He looks at her and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And he said, neither do I condemn you, grace. Go and sin no more, truth. Full grace and full truth. And when we can get this right as the church, we will be a powerful force. Because it's not clean yourself up first, but it's also not, well, let's just throw away the standards so we all feel good about ourselves. There's a place to land that extends grace and protects the moral standards of Christianity. And you can, you can read about how they handled this fight, this church fight in Acts chapter 15. I'm just going to give you the abbreviated version. What had happened was Paul and Barnabas were going city to city and they were preaching the gospel. And they encountered these men who were saying that uh, these people, these Gentiles coming to Christ, need to be circumcised as required by the law of Moses or they can't be saved. So really what that tells us is that their church was mostly women and children. <laughs> Took you a little bit to get that. So Paul did not waste time confronting these false teachers because he knew how damaging this could be to new believers. And so they have this debate, and they can't come to a resolution, so they went to Jerusalem to talk to the leaders of the church. And when they got to Jerusalem, they met with the leaders, and Paul and Barnabas were sharing all that God had been doing, the miracles that were happening. Lives were being changed. And Scripture tells us that there was this group called the Pharisees. And they stand up and they say, the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. Now, the Pharisees were the group of people who conspired to have Jesus crucified. They were the religious police who made sure everybody followed the rules. But now some of them had joined this movement of, of following Christ. They had become Christ followers. They joined this movement, but with them, they brought a whole lot of religious baggage. And so they were basically saying, I know Jesus died for everybody, but it's really hard for me to believe that they don't have to act like us before they can be a part of us. And the Old Testament law was so ingrained in them that they struggled to understand grace. And if you've been in church for a few years or longer, this kind of thinking creeps in. It gradually creeps in over time, and we create our version of Christianity based on our behavior. We make ourselves the standard. And when someone comes along who doesn't act like us, we become just like the Pharisees. And then Peter stands up, one of the 12 disciples, and, and he says, hey guys, I think you're forgetting something. Like you want there to be all of this outward behavior that validates and proves their salvation. But I think you're forgetting something. In verse 8, he says, God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Sometimes we forget that only God knows the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, Man looks at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. 1 Kings 8, 39, For you alone know each heart. See, the, the Pharisees wanted to validate their salvation by outward behavior. But what we forget is that God purifies the heart first, and over time, he purifies our behavior. Around here, we, we say, come as you are. And what that really means is come as you are, but don't remain as you are. We welcome everyone through our doors, but we will always teach the complete word of God, not only what makes people comfortable. Because God's desire isn't that you feel good about yourself. His desire is that you become like Christ. And when you belong in biblical community, you grow and you become more like Jesus. 
And proof of salvation is not that you never fall. It's not that you never mess up. Proof of salvation is that there's conviction and repentance when you mess up. Proverbs 24, 16 says, The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. I will fall down. I will fail. I will mess up, but I will get up again, and I will continue to move forward. It's not about going back to my old life when I fail. It is about getting up and moving forward. That is the proof of salvation. And the Peter also said to them, you know, you're also forgetting that we can't even keep the law perfectly. You're putting a burden on them that we can't even uphold. See, the purpose of the law, the Ten Commandments, and all of those rules in the Old Testament, the purpose of the law is to diagnose the fact that we all have a disease called sin. Because none of us can keep all of those rules. And Jesus said, because you can't keep them all, you need a Savior. So the law diagnoses the sin, but only grace can cure the sin. And we get confused sometimes and think that following the law is what makes us right with God. And we can't teach that. Finally, a guy named James stands up in the middle of this to bring everything to a close because he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem at that time. And in verses 19 and 20, he said, my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols and from sexual immorality. So to the new believers, he's saying, we need to tell them these two things. Don't eat food offered to idols because it's really offensive to their Jewish brothers and sisters. And we're a family. So if anything we do is super offensive to our our other brothers and sisters, we shouldn't do it. And then he says, avoid sexual immorality because no other sin sabotages your walk with God like sexual sin. It's in 1 Corinthians 6.18. And he says, we need to tell them these things, and then we're going to walk with them. The Holy Spirit's going to change them. And James made this pronouncement. And I think this should be the motto of every church. Don't make it difficult for people who are turning to God. Religion makes it difficult to come to God. The gospel makes it possible to come to God. And if you want to know who we are as a church, we are determined to not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. That is who God has called us to be. When we start putting standards in place for new believers that require them to behave like us before they can belong with us, then we've made it all about who's already here. We got in on the basis of grace, and then we want to raise the bar to make it harder for others to come in. And we have to be so cautious. Church is not about who's here. Church is about who's not here yet. And if you're committed, if you're committed, there are some attitudes that we have to avoid. We have to avoid focusing on insiders and forgetting the outsiders. If we aren't careful, we gradually focus only on the people in our circle. We love our groups. We love our serve teams, and that is amazing. You should do that. But there should always be an open chair and an open invitation for those who aren't here yet. And we have to avoid complacency. You know, when we have some success, we can tend to get satisfied with where we are and think this is good enough. And when we become satisfied, we become complacent and end up maintaining rather than advancing. And Jesus called us to advance the kingdom, not maintain something. And we are here to advance. Pastor Darrell shared with us two weeks ago that God has given him a glimpse of a vision for 2019 that is going to require all of us. And if we are complacent, we will not see what God has for us. So here are some questions. If you would say, the journey is my church. I am committed to this church. I want to I put these questions before you. Am I making it difficult for people who are turning to God? Or am I growing in grace and truth? Do I expect people to live up to my standards? Am I only focused on those who are already here, my inner circle, my people? Have I forgotten about those who aren't here yet? You know, we provide invite cards for you at guest services. It's a great tool to have with you. You have a conversation with someone, it makes it easy to just extend that invitation. Hey, would you come to church with me? All the information you need is right here on this card. You can look up our website. You can even watch an experience before you come to see what we're all about. And then the last question is, am I complacent? Do I think where we are right now is good enough? Does change make me nervous? 
Instead of passion, being passionate about, about advancing, you're okay with maintaining where God has us. And if we can fight these attitudes, I believe God will continue to do something unique and powerful through this church. Now, what about the person who is a part of the crowd who says, I go to church. I go to the journey. Kind of like I go to the movies or I go to a game or I go to a concert. You know, sometimes I encounter people out in the community and I've had this conversation multiple times. And they'll see me and they're excited to tell me, hey, I go to your church. And, and, and then we just continue that conversation and, and they share with me, hey, would you pray for me? And of course, I'll pray for you. How can I pray? And most of the time, you know, people have a few, a few things. Sometimes people have a pretty long list. Relationship issues, financial problems, parenting issues, marriage is falling apart. And, and, and they just are saying, hey, will you pray with me? And then I will ask the question, well, where do you serve? Or who's your group leader? And then the conversation takes a shift. And they will say, well, you know, we're in a really busy season. We have a lot going on. Um, we don't get there very often. And here's what I want that person to know. Here's what I want you to know if that sounds familiar. God's greatest desire for you as a follower of Christ was never to go to church. His greatest desire for you is not to show up at a building. His greatest desire and his highest calling for your life is to be conformed to the image of Christ. To be the church, to be planted in the church, not go to a destination. And that is why he created you. That is why he called you. Psalm 92 verse 12 says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. I love that. You know, there's so many um, products out there, anti-aging products. You know, this is the greatest promise right here. Just get planted in the house of the Lord and you're going to stay fruitful. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. What does it mean to flourish? Now, that's not a word we use often. If I see you today and say, hey, how are you? You're probably not going to say, I'm flourishing. I mean, it's just not a word we use all the time. But to flourish means to thrive, to grow, to be a blessing. In the, my Bible dictionary, it used the word abundantly. It has the phrase to break out. And I love that picture because when I read that, I think about uh, if you're breaking out, you can't be contained. So it's not limited. And as we step into a brand new year, would you say you're flourishing? And some of you might say, honestly, I'm not. I'm spiritually dry. I'm not thriving emotionally or in my relationships. And instead of experiencing all God has for you, you feel trapped. You feel restricted. Instead of experiencing what it means to be fulfilled spiritually, you are grasping for things to fulfill you that cannot fulfill you. A job, relationships, money, material things, those will not fulfill you. Think of your life as a seed. Your life has tremendous potential. Potential to grow and to thrive, to produce fruit, to be a blessing to others. But a seed that's not planted will lie dormant and unproductive and unfruitful, never fulfilling its intended purpose. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus talked about this idea of planting seeds and, and growth. And he told a story about a farmer who scattered seeds in the different types of soil he encountered. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 8, it says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. 
But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So some people have potential, but they never grow. They never go anywhere spiritually because they don't prioritize God's word or apply it in their life. And some start to grow, and then they fade away because they don't put down roots. And some actually thrive spiritually, but the worries and the concerns and the struggles of this life choke out that growth. And then Jesus said, a seed that falls on good soil multiplies 30, 60, 100 times. That one seed becomes a massive blessing because it was planted in good soil. If you're not planted and you simply go to church, your decision-making process looks something like this. Are we going to church today? I don't know. We're kind of busy. We've had a crazy week. We can just stay home and watch online. And there's nothing wrong with watching online for certain seasons. If you're working, if you're traveling, if there's sickness, our online experience is a great tool. We actually had someone share with us last week as they were watching our Facebook live stream that they gave their life to Christ. It's an amazing resource. But technology can't replace being connected and coming together with the people of God, with other believers. But, and church isn't a destination. If you are a Christ follower, it's who you are. It's your identity. See, in our family, we never asked ourselves, are we going to church? It wasn't negotiable. I mean, I never asked my kids, do you want to eat today? <laughs> do you want to breathe oxygen today? See, we believe church is vital to our existence. And we didn't ask the question. The Greek word for church is ecclesia. And it means a called out gathering or assembly. Do you see the picture? It's a group, a gathering, an assembly. I don't, I don't want to have relational connection with my kids just through technology. Or only a few times a year. Like, I want my family gathered together in my home, being together. And that is God's desire for us, that we come together. Church is not a, a, a building. It is a gathering of believers. And I'll be honest, some Sundays I wish I had the option to sleep in. I wish I had the option to stay home. And you know what? When I show up, if I'm feeling discouraged, I leave encouraged. I love the worship. I'm so grateful for every person we have who teaches and the unique gifting that God has given them. But do you know why I'm encouraged? I'm encouraged because of you guys. I encounter you. I have conversations with you. And that is what encourages my heart. And when you isolate yourself from the body of Christ, the enemy knows that you will not flourish. And that is his greatest goal for your life. The church does not exist for us. We are the church, and we exist for the world. We come together. We are strengthened. We are unified. We are equipped so that we can go back out and bring in those who aren't here yet. And when you're not planted, you go to church, and your response is, oh, I love that song. It really speaks to me. That message really challenged me. The people were so friendly and welcoming. And maybe you have an emotional encounter with Jesus. But when you're not planted, you never connect with other believers. You never take on the mission of the church for yourself. You go to church, you observe worship, you consume a message, but you don't participate and contribute. So you know you're planted when you move from being a recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. That's what it means to be planted. And if you're not planted, when something or someone disappoints you, when things aren't what you want or a better opportunity comes along, you stop coming as often or you stop coming altogether. But here's my question, because we will disappoint you. We probably already have. Someone's going to let you down because we're all human. Only Jesus will never disappoint you. And you're not going to agree with everything. You're not going to like every decision. But what are you going to do when that happens? Are you going to leave? Are you going to go to another church? Are you going to give up on church altogether? Because if you go somewhere else, 
What are you going to do when they disappoint you? What are you going to do when there's something there that doesn't go your way? My dad was a gardener, and every season when it was time to plant, he would break up the ground, and he would prepare it before he planted the seeds. And he would try to remove anything that would hinder that seed from growing and flourishing and, and becoming the seed, the, the plant, and producing what it was supposed to produce. And once the seed sprouted and started to grow, he had to keep working the ground. He had to remove weeds. He had to water it. Um, and when weeds popped up or, or the ground got hard, he didn't look at that plant and say, oh, man, this isn't what I expected. This isn't ideal. I'm going to pull this plant up and move it over here. And then when the weeds pop up there and the ground gets hard, he didn't say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this plant up and move it over here. Because here's what he knew. If a plant cannot put down deep roots, it will never produce fruit. It will never flourish. You have to keep working the ground around that plant so it will flourish. He knew that. You have to keep working the ground where you're planted if you want to flourish. So I want to challenge you today. If you aren't planted, I want to encourage you to get planted. If you were once planted and now you're not, I want to encourage you, replant. Jeremiah 17 verse 7 says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. See, if you make the Lord your hope and your confidence, you're not going to be devastated when people disappoint you. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried about long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. When your roots grow deep, you're not bothered by what's happening above the surface because below the surface you're connected to a greater source. Redwood trees. Redwood trees are the tallest living things on the planet. They can grow to be 30 stories high and three stories wide. To give you some perspective, um, if you're familiar with downtown Jacksonville, the Wells Fargo Tower is 37 stories. So just to give you some perspective, how does a tree grow to be that big? They have deep roots. Their, their roots will go down up to 150 feet and out up to 100 feet. And below the surface, beneath the surface, below the ground, their roots intertwine. Let me think about the redwood forest. Okay, their roots intertwine. So the root systems intertwine, and they have a system, a support system that sustains the strength and the growth that's happening above the ground. Satan doesn't care if you go to church. He doesn't care. But if you decide to get planted, I promise he will come at you with every excuse. He will point out every inconvenience. He will tell you that church is irrelevant. He will point out every flaw and every issue with the church and convince you because he knows if he can keep you in isolation, he can keep you from flourishing. Jeremiah 17 also says when you are planted, you produce fruit. Galatians 5 tells us what that fruit looks like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Can you say at the end of 2018 that you see more of these traits in your life than you did on January 1st. Because that is the true measure of flourishing. So here's my wager to you for 2019. Just try it. Just get planted. Serve. Attend worship consistently. Start making a difference. Start praying for other people and have them pray for you. Be a voice of encouragement. And if you serve, let me tell you what happens. If you serve in our next gen ministry and a kid comes to you and they say, you know what? I don't have a mom at home. I don't have a dad at home. But you're like mom. You're like dad to me. Thank you. Thank you for showing up consistently. If you, show, if you serve with our babies and our toddlers and you change diapers and, and you rock those babies to sleep and a mom or a dad comes to you and says, thank you. I got to go and worship today and God spoke to me. God's changing my life. You serve on our guest experience team, and someone comes to you and says, thank you for making me feel welcome. I was afraid to come to church, but because you made me feel welcome, I'm here, and God is changing my life. 
when you realize that God is using you to make a difference in someone else's life, there is no high, there is no thrill, there is no hit that can compare with that. But you don't know until you get connected. Here's what I want you to do. You have to realize it's not about you. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not about me. God saved you to be a part of something bigger. And here's the deal. If you will get planted, if you will put down roots, your church will be friendly if you are friendly. Your church will do a great work if you work. Your church will make a difference if you make a difference. Your church will be generous if you are generous. These seats will be filled if you fill them. You know, here's the challenge. We, we think we're going to find the perfect church for us. It doesn't exist. Just like unicorns, it does not exist. If you will commit and align your heart with the vision of your church, whether it's the journey or another church, if you will align your heart with the vision of that church in line with that leadership, and if you will commit to be all of the things that you want your church to be, your church will be the church you want. Did you get that? If you will commit to be all of the things that you want your church to be, your church will be the church you want. But if you only see the things that are wrong and you point that out and you focus on that and you magnify that, it will never be the church you want. And every church has flaws. Peter said to Jesus in John chapter 6, give you a little backstory on it. Jesus had just miraculously fed 5,000 people and the crowds were following him. They were saying, Jesus, do more miracles, meet our needs, do something for us. And Jesus challenged their self-centered thinking. And he said to them that following him was about being a part of something greater. It's about serving others. It's about laying down your life. And in verse 41, it says, the people began to murmur and complain. How quickly people change when they don't get their way. And verse 66 says, many of them turned away and deserted him. The crowd left, and Jesus turned to the 12 disciples. He turned to the committed, and he asked, are you also going to leave? And Peter said to him, Lord, where else would we go? Where else would we go? We have experienced something with you and being a part of your work that we can't experience anywhere else. The crowd leaves when things get uncomfortable, but the committed know there's no other place. There is no other place they can go outside of the church where they will grow and flourish. You will not flourish apart from the church. You might stay alive. You might survive. But you will not flourish spiritually, emotionally, relationally. And if you live by the conviction that this life is preparation for eternity, that one day we're going to stand before God and give an account of how we lived, then you realize, where else could we go? Where else will we have the opportunity to multiply and advance the kingdom like we can when we're planted in the church? Because we're stronger and we're more effective together. And so my challenge to you for 2019 is stop going to church. Get planted and be the church. Because if you are a follower of Christ, it is who you are. And if you are planted, if you are committed, my challenge to you is don't be a Pharisee. Fight those attitudes. Don't make it difficult for those who are turning to God. Don't be complacent. You know, our vision, I shared with you earlier that our mission is to engage our culture with the irresistible love of Jesus Christ. The vision is what happens when the mission's becoming reality. When you're accomplishing the mission, the vision becomes real. Our vision is that we will equip and mobilize disciples who will transform our city and our world for Jesus Christ. It's a movement. That as people come to Christ and we equip them and we disciple them, we're going right back out. And we're transforming this city and this world for Jesus Christ. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are those here today and joining us online who you're just checking this out. You're just checking out church. You're checking out Christianity. Here's my challenge to you. Just keep coming. Just keep showing up. Ask God to reveal himself to you. And if you have questions or if you need prayer, that's why we're here. So as we close today and we prepare for 2019, I want to pray for you.
because God is building a vision for 2019 in the heart of our pastor. And as he wrestles that out with God and he prepares to share that with us, it will take all of us making the commitment to get planted, to put down deep roots. And I promise it will be a banner year for you and it will be a banner year for this church. You may not get everything you want in 2019. You may not get rich in 2019. But if you will put down roots and if you will get planted, I promise God will do a work in your life. And at the end of 2019, you'll be able to look back and say, God did this in my heart and through my life. So I want to pray for you today. God, we thank you for the church. It is an honor and it is a privilege to be a part of your body, to gather with your people. And so now, God, I pray that you will raise us up and send us back out to encounter those who desperately need to know that you love them. That there is hope and there is grace and there is peace. And God, we pray that you will do a work in our life. That God, as that seed is planted and, and your word is the light. And, and Jesus, you are the living water. And Holy Spirit, you are the, the fire that warms that seed to produce growth. And, and God, we're going to trust you that over time, God, you're going to put down deep roots in our life. And you're going to produce something in us that we cannot produce ourselves. God, I pray that we will be the church that you've called us to be. That we will remember that there are so many who desperately need to know about you. God, for those who are on the fence today, and they're wrestling and they're struggling, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will challenge them. Whether it is here at the Journey or at another church, if they call themselves a follower of Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, today I pray you'll challenge them to get planted to get planted under a vision that they can align with and to commit to be all that they want to see their church become. God, we thank you. Thank you for grace. Thank you that you met us where we are. None of us deserve to be a part of this, but we're so grateful that you allow us to be. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray.